I made a serious mistake driven by my selfish desires, and sadly, it cost me the love of my life. The thought of hurting him is unbearable, and realizing he's gone forever is heart-wrenching. I had hoped we could overcome my errors together. I had a wonderful partner and friend, but I foolishly gave it all up for meaningless encounters with strangers. My encounter with my future husband, Donnie, happened when I was just twenty, in a library. He kindly fetched a book for me from a high shelf, sparking a conversation that led to us exchanging phone numbers. Donnie may not have fit the conventional standards of attractiveness, but his irresistible charm captivated me. What started as a friendship swiftly blossomed into a romantic relationship. He was my first in everything, my first date, first kiss, first love, and my first intimate experience. For him, I wasn't his first, as he had more experience than me, making me feel inadequate. When Donnie proposed, I felt a mix of happiness and fear that I might be making the wrong choice in a life partner. After all, I had no one to compare him to. That's when I first suggested the idea of an open relationship, thinking it would help me gain more experience before committing fully. I wanted to be sure he was the one for me. Donnie's reaction was intense, he vehemently refused, expressing that he didn't want to share me and saw me as his future wife. His words deeply moved me, causing me to forget about the idea of an open relationship. I agreed to become his wife wholeheartedly. Our wedding was an intimate affair filled with joy, surrounded by our loved ones. The first year of our marriage was pure bliss. However, as time passed, my lingering doubts resurfaced. I began to worry that marriage had deprived me of exciting sexual adventures that my friends freely shared stories about. I felt I had nothing to contribute in those conversations. I decided to bring up the subject with Donnie, albeit hesitantly at first. I hinted at the idea of an open relationship, but his reaction made it clear that pushing further might lead to losing him. I tried to broach the topic of spicing up our intimate life, but his firm and unequivocal response infuriated me. He said he would leave immediately. I felt that he was imposing unfair limitations, especially since he had dated multiple women before me. Why shouldn't I have the same freedom? A few months later, I revisited the topic only to receive the same stern response. I admit it was a selfish act on my part, marrying him while secretly harboring an interest in other men. I allowed my thoughts to wander while naively hoping to maintain Donnie's love. Now I despise myself for betraying the most precious person in my life and succumbing to temptation. There is often a triggering event that drives our base instincts. In my case, it was Bob. He was an imposing figure, built like a bodybuilder, and his snug-fitting attire accentuated his bulging muscles. He effortlessly attracted the attention of women. An assertive, self-assured alpha male, Bob was relocated to my department, becoming my immediate supervisor. This meant we had daily one-on-one -on -one briefings. He was in his thirties, older than both my husband and me. He had a flirtatious manner, speaking softly as if constantly trying to seduce me. It was challenging to maintain a professional demeanor around him without experiencing a rush of excitement. One evening, Bob invited me for drinks after work, and I couldn't believe it. Was he genuinely interested, or was it just a polite gesture? My mind raced, but I couldn't turn him down. We went to a nearby bar, and I ended up drinking more. Then I should have, our conversation shifted from formal discussions to intimate exchanges. I confessed my desire for more than just being committed to one man. I divulged everything from the concept of an open marriage that allows sexual freedom without guilt, to my attraction to him. Bob inquired if I had discussed this with my husband, and I told him yes, but my husband didn't share my perspective and threatened to leave if I pursued it. Bob then advised me not to seek permission, but to present it to my husband as an established decision. He suggested making our marriage open, allowing me to explore this without requiring Donnie's approval. Looking back, Bob was the embodiment of poor choices, offering terrible advice while claiming it was for my benefit. Now I understand he simply wanted to be with me, but in that moment, I grasped for any justification for my desires. That night, Bob took me to a hotel, making me feel like the center of the universe. Donnie had made me feel that way every day but experiencing it with another man made me feel like an infatuated teenager again. When I returned home, my husband was already asleep on the couch, seemingly waiting for me to return from work. I discreetly went to the bathroom to wash away the scent of alcohol and unfamiliar cologne. Then I woke Donnie up and informed him I had something to discuss. He mentioned having important and joyful news to share as well, but allowed me to speak first. His face initially lit up with delight as he listened attentively, only for it to darken within seconds. 
but I was resolute in my decision, presenting it as a fact that I wanted to spend time with other men and hoped he would support me. I yearned for the admiration and adoration from other men, similar to how Donnie had once treated other women. What nonsense I spewed at the person who had cherished me. Those words still haunt me, and tears well up whenever I recall that moment. I was a fool. He stared at me for a prolonged moment, then lowered his head in defeat. After sitting in silence for what felt like an eternity, he muttered, Well, if that's what you want, then fine by me. He got up and left without ever sharing his joyful news. The very next day, I eagerly embraced my boss. We had an encounter on his desk, marking only the beginning. Bob became my first lover after Donnie, but far from my last. I began going out on Fridays with colleagues to their favorite pub and occasionally woke up on Saturdays in the arms of a stranger I never saw again. I had transformed into a promiscuous woman, convinced that Donnie had come to terms with it. I continued to engage with different men almost daily. However, after two months, reality hit me. One Friday, as I prepared for work, Bob came to pick me up, assuming my husband had already left as usual. I thought we could take the opportunity for a few encounters before heading to the office. However, Donnie was still at home. When I returned, my husband opened the door to find Bob standing there with a bouquet of flowers. Their conversation was drowned out by the noise of the shower. When I emerged, they were conversing amicably, as if everything were normal. Donnie was always composed, showing no signs of anger, hurt, disappointment, or sadness. He wore either a smile or a frown, consequently. I genuinely believed he was perfectly fine with our open marriage. My naive and immature mind failed to realize I was heading towards my own downfall. On the way to work, Bob made light of how well my husband had embraced the concept of an open relationship. It was a Friday. Bob and I reserved a room with expansive views of the city skyline. That night, we engaged in passionate intimacy. I returned home on Saturday and immediately sensed that something was amiss. An eerie silence hung in the air. My husband and I typically didn't work on weekends, and he always had his favorite music blaring from the speakers. I glanced into our home gym, but he wasn't on the treadmill as he usually was on Saturday mornings. Hoping for a semblance of normalcy, I proceeded to the kitchen where he'd typically prepare coffee. On the countertop, I noticed my favorite mug. It brought a smile to my face, offering a glimmer of our shared life. I reached for the mug, eager for a sip, but it was empty inside. I found an envelope containing a letter. I can't recall the exact words, but I've kept it as a painful reminder of how I allowed a once beautiful marriage to crumble for the sake of casual affairs. I am deeply disappointed in myself. I've made numerous foolish decisions, but losing Donnie is my most profound regret. The letter revealed that Donnie had embarked on a month-long business trip to Canada. Upon his return, he intended to initiate divorce proceedings. He expressed regret for marrying me and spending so much time together. Next to the letter was a plane ticket and a passport issued in my name. On the back of the ticket was a message, remember the news I shared two months ago? Well, here it is. My company was willing to cover our accommodations in Canada and offered you a job. At the bottom of the mug lay his wedding ring. My world crumbled before my eyes. I spent the remainder of the day staring blankly at that mug, unable to eat or drink, just lost in despair. What followed was profound depression as my life gradually unraveled. The very next day, as if following a script, Donnie's best friend arrived to remove all of his belongings. I wailed inconsolably as I watched him and some movers take away nearly everything that belonged to my husband. Donnie's friend shot me a disgusted look and called me a disgrace. His words stung then, but they cut even deeper now because since my husband's departure, my home has felt painfully empty and desolate. In an attempt to distract myself from the pain of losing my beloved, I hopped from one affair to another, from one bed to the next, trying to numb the ache deep within. Then, barely a week after everything had unraveled, Bob submitted a transfer request. When I asked him why, mentioning that I believed something special was developing between us, he responded coldly, stating he was moving on now that the excitement had faded. I felt utterly betrayed. My new boss immediately took a strong disliking to me. My personal life had left me in such anguish that it had a severe impact on my job performance. It didn't take long before I was terminated due to another mistake. My parents and friends disassociated themselves from me completely. Donnie's friend had spilled the beans about my promiscuous behavior. They wanted nothing to do with someone who had discarded her marriage for another man, branding me as a harlot. In a very short period, 
I lost every person who had meant something to me. A month later, Downey returned from his trip and initiated our divorce proceedings. I made numerous attempts to plead with him, urging him to listen and allow me to explain. I even suggested couples counseling, suspecting I might have had nymphomania, but he completely rejected any engagement with me. By the time our formal separation was complete, I found myself without our cozy home, without the support of my loving partner, and without a single person who cared about me. I still harbor deep self-loathing for having ruined it all. Alright, that was a fun story. Now let's move on to another exciting one. Stay tuned and let's dive in. My wife's name was Mona, and at 28, she may not have been considered conventionally attractive, but her incredible physique more than compensated for any facial imperfections. I adored her. She possessed intelligence, a great sense of humor, and I believed I could entrust her with my life. Mona worked as an environmental biologist for the state's Environmental Protection Department. As for me, I'm Jim, 30 years old, a civil engineer employed by a consulting firm. Together, we earned a comfortable income, and a year ago, we purchased a lovely three-bedroom suburban bungalow. We crossed paths due to our careers, dated for six months, got engaged, and soon after exchanged vows in a church wedding. Before our marriage, we both pledged unwavering commitment to fidelity, mutual respect, and trust, laying a strong foundation for our union. Our plans included starting a family with children upon moving into our house a year ago. Mona struck up a friendship with a neighbor named Sally, who was active in local affairs. Sally, a divorced woman of Mona's age, often accompanied her on shopping trips into the movies. I didn't mind, since I preferred staying at home where I could indulge in my love for books while Mona was out. Sally even introduced Mona to the local library board, where they served together. These board meetings, initially brief monthly gatherings, evolved into four-hour sessions held twice a month. A couple of months ago, Mona explained that the extended meetings were necessary to implement a more interactive computer system at the library. Due to her computer expertise, she was asked to collaborate with the head librarian after these meetings to establish criteria for the new system. It all seemed reasonable to me, so I didn't think much of it. I do recall that after her first lengthy board meeting, Mona appeared unusually edgy and distracted for a few days. When I inquired about the issue, she mentioned that the head librarian was challenging to work with. Update, now let's consider my observation of her damp hair. Finding her hair damp at the back indicated that she had either broken a sweat or taken a shower somewhere. But why would she be perspiring or need a shower while she was supposedly at a meeting? I knew she hadn't showered Ed or even had time to splash her face at the sink after returning home, as I had been awake waiting for her. A quick whiff of her skin confirmed the presence of soap and not the usual bath soap she used. Where could she have taken a shower? Perhaps at a motel? These suspicions left me less inclined to be intimate with her. Not tonight, honey. I'm too exhausted. The meeting was quite long, and we both have work tomorrow. All right, sweetheart. Get a good night's rest, she shifted to her side of the bed, facing away from me, and drifted off to sleep. I found it peculiar that she wasn't interested in maximizing our intimacy during her fertile period. However, I recalled her consistently declining lovemaking after her library meetings, attributing it to fatigue. These recurring patterns raised further doubts. She likely wished to conceal any signs of her post-encounter looseness. We had discussed starting a family, having been married for five years and waiting until we were financially secure. With her no longer working, I had recently received a promotion, and we believed it was the right time to conceive. So, she had stopped taking birth control pills a week ago. However, if she were involved with someone else and we divorced, I didn't want to be financially responsible for a child. I needed time to weigh my options. I lay awake for a while, contemplating my next steps. Initially, I decided to delay being intimate with her. Confronting her with only a slight dampness as evidence of potential infidelity would likely lead to denial and laughter on her part. More substantial proof was required, which meant delaying intimacy to gather the necessary evidence. On the other hand, if there was a possibility that her lover had impregnated her tonight, she might be eager to have sex with me to cover it up. After considering all the possibilities, I settled on a plan that might work. If she had engaged in unprotected intercourse with someone else tonight, she would likely be desperate to have sex with me as soon as possible to ensure her fertile period had passed. And to implement my plan effectively, I would need to be away for at least a week, if not longer. 
faking a business trip seemed like the best way to do this, as I rarely traveled for work. But when I did, it often required a week or more away from home, which would conveniently align with my plan. Now, what else did I need to know? Ah, yes. Who was her lover? How long had their affair been ongoing? Where did they usually meet? If the rendezvous coincided with library board meetings, it could imply that her lover might also be a board member. I needed to investigate further. So, I quietly slipped out of bed, descended the stairs, and located her purse. This was where women typically kept their valuable items, making it a good place to begin my search for clues. While checking her credit cards, I stumbled upon one in her maiden name, Mona Spencer. It belonged to a bank we didn't normally use, and I couldn't help but wonder why she still had it. I had assumed she had disposed of all her old cards before her marriage, but evidently, she had retained one in a concealed pocket. I discovered a business card belonging to a certain Derek Matthews, the head librarian at our local library. This discovery was quite a shock, since she had led me to believe that the head librarian was a woman. I proceeded to inspect the call logs on her cell phone, where I found Derek's name listed along with numerous calls, both to and from him. It seemed their relationship had been ongoing for quite some time. There were no instant messages, suggesting that they likely communicated verbally. Nevertheless, I discreetly returned everything to her purse and decided to check our computer for messages. Upon further investigation, I found that she had a secured email folder. With some knowledge of security, I managed to bypass her protections and uncovered a treasure trove of messages between her and Derek, dating back to when she had started attending those late meetings with him. These messages revealed that they had been meeting at the Red Roof and near the interstate interchange. Some of their activities were clearly things she had never done with me. In one email, they even discussed me and Derek's wife. While their words weren't flattering, both claimed to love us. The more I read, the angrier I became. I copied all their emails to my own files, intending to print them later. I then returned upstairs to one of the spare bedrooms, where I had my clothes stored in the closet. The walk-in closet in the master bedroom was left for her clothes. I grabbed my suitcase and garment bag, packing them as if preparing for an impending business trip. By this time, it was 5.30 a.m., and I dressed as though I were ready for travel. Entering our bedroom, I woke Mona, who sat up looking puzzled. What are you doing up so early, Jim? Why are you dressed, she asked. I have a plane to catch, sweetheart, I replied. I didn't get a chance to tell you last night, but I received a call from work. They urgently need someone to conduct a survey on some out-of-state projects. I'll grab a bite at the airport, so don't worry about breakfast. She gazed at me, trying to comprehend the news. Okay, honey. How can I reach you if I need to? Just call me on my cell phone. Goodbye, sweetheart, I said as I kissed her and headed downstairs with my bags. Suddenly, I heard a thud behind me and the sound of hurried footsteps. She appeared at the top of the stairs, calling out, Jim. Jim, what about trying for a baby? We were going to do that this weekend. We'll have to wait until next month, sweetheart. I'll call you when I reach my first destination, I replied. I heard a loud cry behind me as I opened the garage door and entered my car. I quickly left the garage and drove down the street, ensuring my cell phone was switched off as I headed towards the interstate. Two hours later, I reached my dad's retirement home situated by a lake in a more remote area. Dad was a widower and lived alone. Although my visit was unexpected, he immediately started preparing breakfast for us while sipping his strong morning coffee. I confided in him about the situation with Mona. He expressed deep sympathy upon hearing about her betrayal. My parents had two sons, and I think he always secretly wished for a daughter, so Mona had filled that role for him. He couldn't believe she would do this to me, I said. Son, I'm at a loss for words. Your mother and I had a rock-solid relationship, and to my knowledge, she never strayed. You'll need to take this one step at a time, but don't rush into any decisions without careful consideration, he advised. I understand, Dad. Tomorrow, I'll head back to the city and consult with my lawyer, Ed Willie. I need to understand what legal options are available to me. Ed is a trustworthy man, he won't steer you wrong. We've relied on his services for years. Okay, Dad, your coffee is as excellent as always, and your omelets are great. Well, if you end up cooking for yourself, you'll have a chance to practice, he replied with a hint of humor. Around 9 o'clock that morning, I called my office and spoke to my boss. 
he agreed to inform Mona that I was on a business trip and could only be reached on my cell phone. He even instructed the receptionist to provide the same explanation to anyone who inquired about my whereabouts. I requested a week off, which he granted. Upon checking my messages, I noticed that Mona had attempted to contact me four times, requesting that I call her as soon as possible. I decided to wait until around noon to return her call. When I did, she sounded somewhat anxious. Where are you, honey? Could I fly out to spend the weekend with you? I'm sorry, sweetheart, but I'm on the road, and I'm not certain when I'll be able to establish a place to stay for a while. Let's make sure we plan something for next month, I replied. Gotta go now, the guys are calling me, I added as I heard her say, I love you, before ending the call. My dad, who had been listening, simply shook his head. The following day, I scheduled an appointment to meet with Ed Willie. Upon returning to town, I discussed my situation with him. It's good to see you, Jim. What can I assist you with? Ed asked. Ed, my wife has been unfaithful to me with another man, and I'd like to understand my legal options. Over the next half hour, we explored the potential courses of action, and Ed recommended that if I sought a divorce, the simplest approach would be to base it on irreconcilable differences. Pursuing a divorce on grounds of adultery would require me to bear the burden of proof, which could be costly and challenging to obtain evidence that would hold up in court. Given our lack of children and my wife's substantial income, the financial aspect of the divorce would likely entail a straightforward 50-50 division of assets. I inquired about the possibility of her being pregnant with the other man's child, relieved to hear that child support would not fall under my responsibility. I expressed gratitude for his help and informed him that I would decide on the course of action in a few days. After my meeting with Ed, I proceeded to the main library, aimlessly wandering until I noticed an office door labeled Head Librarian. Picking up a magazine, I settled down in a spot where I could keep an eye on the office door and waited. Approximately 30 minutes later, the door opened, revealing a man around my age. He didn't strike me as particularly handsome, which made me wonder why she would jeopardize our marriage for an affair with him. I left and made my way to a local electronics store, where I purchased an expensive voice-activated recording device. Afterward, I headed to the Red Roof Inn where they had been meeting and booked a room for the night. With some time to spare, I returned home discreetly and revisited our PC. The new emails exchanged between them suggested her concern about a potential pregnancy from their last encounter, given my recent absence, which would expose her infidelity. He might be held responsible for the child. It was evident that they were growing apprehensive. I made copies of these messages from my records and left after having dinner. I returned to my motel room and watched TV for a while. Later, I turned it off, lying on the bed deep in thought, pondering why she had chosen to act as she did, jeopardizing our marriage. As far as I knew, our relationship had been filled with love, wonderful plans for the future including starting a family and retiring together. Yet, she had thrown it all away. Our sex life had been fulfilling when we first married. Her response to my business trip indicated that she had engaged in unprotected intercourse with him, potentially resulting in a pregnancy. Her decision to give him the opportunity to father her child led me to believe that she harbored deep feelings for him. Overwhelmed by emotions, tears welled up as I reflected on the time we had spent together. Although there had been moments of joy during our years together, the pain of our ending overshadowed it all. I eventually came to the realization that even if she didn't become pregnant by him, I couldn't find it in my heart to forgive her. Divorce seemed to be the only solution, but I knew I had to confront her first, and I wasn't looking forward to it. At around 8 o'clock, I used my cell phone to call home and spoke with her. It was evident from her voice that she had been crying, so I asked her what was wrong. You don't sound well, sweetheart. Are you sick? Oh, Jim, I just want you home. Well, I'll try to resolve things as quickly as I can. Hang in there. Why don't you go and talk to Sally? I'm sure she can cheer you up. I have suspected that Sally might have been involved in my wife's infidelity, so I had nothing to lose if they spent time together. Okay, honey. Hurry home. I love you. I will, sweetheart. Goodbye. I hope she noticed that I didn't reciprocate with an I love you when I signed off. At 11 o'clock that night, I went to the motel office and found a young man working alone. I was relieved about that because a female clerk might have refused to do what I was about to ask. After some friendly conversation while we were alone, I offered the young man $100.
Given his not-so-great pay, the offer was tempting enough for him to agree to provide me with a record of the times my wife and Derek had stayed at the motel. I gave him my wife's maiden name and the date when I suspected their rendezvous had started. I assumed they would use the credit card in her maiden name, which I had found in her purse, to minimize the risk of discovery. He promised to work on it that night and have the list ready for me in the morning. I went to bed feeling down and had a restless night's sleep. Early the next morning, I returned to the motel office, and the young man had the list ready for me. It confirmed my suspicions. They had checked in after the library meetings. I showed him a picture of my wife, and he recalled her as she had registered using her credit card. They typically only used the room for about an hour or so before leaving in separate cars. He mentioned that this was typical of many cheating spouses he had seen. After having breakfast, I headed back to my dad's place. I spent the rest of the week fishing, and on Thursday, I called Ed Willie and asked him to proceed with the divorce papers. He assured me they'd be ready in a few days. I continued to call home every evening pretending I was in a different city. Mona sounded increasingly despondent with each call, and I began to feel a twinge of pity for her. However, I couldn't bring myself to let her off the hook. I wanted my revenge, though it was bittersweet. I returned home on a Friday afternoon while she was still at work. Based on their recent emails, it seemed that the affair was winding down, likely due to the fear of her pregnancy it appeared. That I wouldn't need the tape recorder anymore, so I could return it and get a refund. I had gathered enough evidence of her infidelity from their email correspondence. I began printing two copies of their email communications, thinking that Derek's wife might benefit from having a record of their affair. My next decision was whether to confront Mona immediately or wait to see if she became pregnant. When Mona got home from work, she threw herself into my arms, tears in her eyes. Oh Jim, I missed you so much, sweetheart. What's wrong? Did something happen, like a plumbing issue? I asked. No, I just realized how much I love and missed you after you left. As soon as we've had dinner, I want to take you to bed. If you're that eager, I should consider going away more often. No, no, I don't want you to leave me again. All right, sweetheart. Let's go out to eat and then come back home for some quality time. It sounds like a plan, I said with a smile, noticing her tears. I felt like a terrible person. We had a surprisingly calm dinner at our favorite bistro, and when we returned home, she began undressing as she ascended the stairs to our bedroom. By the time I reached the bedroom, she was already lying on the bed. Hurry, honey. Looking at her, I knew I would miss her, but I couldn't bear to share her with anyone else. She had been exclusively mine, and now she wasn't. I knew she expected me to make love to her in case she was pregnant, however, I reasoned that it didn't really matter whether she was pregnant or not. It was over, and I needed to tell her. I sat up on the side of the bed. Mona, we need to talk. I can't go on pretending, picturing you with Derek. I heard her gasp, and when I turned to look at her, she stared back at me in horror. It's over, Mona. I'm going to file for divorce. She suddenly got up and rushed toward the bathroom. I went downstairs, poured myself a drink, and waited for her to come down. She would likely want to salvage something from the wreckage of our marriage maybe even try to talk me out of divorcing her. Sitting in a dimly lit room with only the kitchen light in the background, I sipped my drink and contemplated my life and the uncertain path that lay ahead. I was still young and had the opportunity to build the family I desired. My career was on an upward trajectory. Maybe, all things considered, it wasn't too bad, but I still felt depressed. It seemed like she was starting to enter a state of denial and would be down soon. A few minutes later, I heard her descending the stairs, and I observed her as she entered the living room and sat across from me. I reached up and turned on a light. Are you ready to talk now? Are you ready to explain why you did it? I asked. Yes, she whispered. I really don't know why. The first time we did it, I swore I wasn't going to do it again. We started meeting for a drink after our meetings, and you know how things heat up after a couple of drinks. It seemed exciting, and it got easier after a few times. I think listening to Sally tell me about how good it made her feel to cheat on her ex-husband made me want to try it. I should have realized after she told me that they divorced because of her infidelity that this would happen. Why did you do it the first time? Was there something in our pre-marriage conversation about mutual fidelity, trust, and respect that you didn't understand? Or was there something in our wedding vows to forsake all others that you didn't comprehend or couldn't agree with? 
if you couldn't grasp or agree with it, why didn't you communicate that to me? I've wasted five years of my life on you, and now I have to search for another wife. Hopefully, this time I can find someone who understands the meaning of marital fidelity. Oh Jim, can't we find a way around this somehow? I love you. I don't want you to leave me. I want to have your children. Please, honey, let's get one thing clear, you no longer have the right to address me with terms of endearment. You lost that right when you allowed him to have you. Do you understand? I was getting frustrated with her attitude. She was still in denial about our impending divorce, but I had to maintain my composure and stay on a higher ground. Speaking of children, when do you think you'll know if you're pregnant? This was the second time tonight that I had seen her look at me as though she couldn't believe what she had just heard. Oh my god, you know? Yes, I know, Mona. Why do you think I faked that business trip? I wanted you to start feeling some pain. That's the primary reason I'm divorcing you. You deliberately tried to get pregnant by your lover. You were hoping I'd accept you after waiting a day after he deposited his seed in you and then hoped I'd assume responsibility for your lover's child. Well, that isn't going to happen. What you tried to do was as treacherous an act as any woman can commit against her husband. It was utterly disrespectful to me. There's no way under the sun I can ever forgive you for that. Even if you hadn't done that, I might have considered forgiving you if it had happened just once and stopped, but you kept going back for more. You became addicted to cheating, and there's no way I can ever trust you again, even if you undergo 20 years of therapy. Now, do you have anything to say that could mitigate your actions? No, she replied as tears streamed down her face. That's it then. I've already initiated the process with Ed Willie to have divorce papers prepared. They should be ready by Monday. We'll split all our assets 50 50ths, and there will be no alimony, even if you're pregnant. No child support. It won't be my child. Do you agree to this arrangement? It sounds okay. I will talk to a lawyer before I sign, but it sounds okay, she sobbed. Very well then. I will sleep in the spare room until we officially separate. In the meantime, I'll be looking for an apartment. You can stay here and entertain your lovers after I'm gone. It's over between Derek and me. I gather that from your emails. It's a shame you didn't end it a long time ago. Tomorrow, I'll go explain everything to your parents and your brother. I don't want you giving them a story that makes this all my fault. They need to know what kind of daughter they have. If you're pregnant, I'll also find a way to let your co-workers and our friends know what you've done to me. Oh no, she began crying again, and I got up and went upstairs to bed. The next morning, I woke up early and left the house before she woke up, taking a copy of the emails and motel records with me. She had cried most of the night and must be exhausted by now. I had breakfast at IHOP. From now on, I would be eating out quite a bit, so I thought I'd better get used to it. Taking my time over my coffee, I waited until 7.30 and headed over to Mona's parents. They were early risers, so I didn't think it would be inconvenient to arrive early. I knocked on the kitchen door, and I saw that they were having breakfast. Mona's dad waved me in when he recognized me. Upon entering, they pointed to an empty chair at the table as Mona's mother poured me a cup of coffee. What are you doing over here this early, Jim? Would you like some breakfast? Mona's dad inquired. No, no breakfast. I've already eaten at IHOP, and I've got some bad news that I didn't think you should hear secondhand. Bad news, Mona's mother dropped the coffee carafe she was still holding, and it shattered on the tile floor, breaking the divorce. Why, Jim, surely you're not serious. You were planning to start a family, she exclaimed. I found out that she's been cheating on me for the last few months, and she might already be pregnant by her lover, I explained. Mona's younger brother, Simon, entered the kitchen and heard my statement. He exclaimed, and they all stared at me as though I told them the world was coming to an end. They all started to talk at once. Are you sure? You've got to be kidding. Where is she? Can't you work this out? Who is the other man? They bombarded me with questions and I tried to answer them as best I could. Yes, I'm sure. I have emails and motel records to prove it, and she admits to it. She's at home right now, as far as I know, unless she's gone over to her friend Sally for sympathy. I don't think I can work this out because I'm certain she tried to get herself pregnant by him and planned to pass the child off as mine. That's something no husband can forgive. Her lover is Derek Matthews, the head librarian. He's married too, and I understand he has children. Mona's mother hurried to the phone. 
I'm calling her right now. This is too sad to believe that a daughter of mine could act so badly. I wish you would, I responded. She's not only ruined our marriage, but probably is as well. I had found out where Derek Matthews lived and went to his home, parking in the street in front of their modest bungalow. I went up to the front door with the packet of data and rang the bell. Derek opened the door and looked at me with tears in his eyes. Can I help you? he asked. I'd like to talk to your wife and give her something, Mr. Matthews. I'm sorry, my wife isn't here. Give it to me, and I'll give it to her. Mr. Matthews, I know Mona has called you and told you I was on the way. There is no way you can stop me from getting this information to your wife or prevent me from speaking with her. I would suggest you let her come to the door, or I will consider filing a lawsuit against you for alienation of affection. He hesitated and then, looking away, he called back over his shoulder, Marge, there's someone here to see you. Then he turned to me and said, you scoundrel. No, Mr. Matthews, you are the scoundrel for having an affair with my wife and attempting to impregnate her. You've shattered my marriage, and I hope I can do the same to yours, I replied with a sigh. He turned away from the door as his wife approached. She asked, Yes, Mrs. Matthews? I have some news for you. Your husband has been having an affair with my wife for the last several months, and I am in the process of divorcing her. I have copies of emails they've exchanged, which provide evidence of the affair, and a list of the dates and times they met at the motel. I felt sorry for her as she processed my words trying to make sense of the situation. Are you sure? She asked. Can I ask your husband, Mrs. Matthews? He's standing right behind you, I responded. She turned to look at him, and he suddenly broke down in tears. I'm sorry, Marge. I'm so sorry, he sobbed. Her face reflected sadness, and I expressed my own sorrow, saying, I'm sorry too, Mrs. Matthews, that we married such sorry excuses for spouses. I'm also sorry for you and your children. You should be aware that my wife may be pregnant by your husband. I suppose we won't do anything about that until it happens, handing her the package. I told her she could do whatever she wanted with it, and then turned and walked away. She looked profoundly sad, and I wished there had been a way to shield her from this situation. I had achieved my initial goal and returned home. Mona's car was gone, and I didn't know or care where she had gone. Just a short time ago. I felt incomplete unless she was around or I thought she was safe somewhere else. Now, I didn't care. I changed my clothes and began mowing the lawn. Update, Mona confirmed her pregnancy, opting for an abortion despite her family's objections, which led to her estrangement. Our divorce proceeded as planned, leaving me single and on the lookout for a new partner. Betrayed once, I'm grappling with defining new partner selection criteria, seeking solace in therapy and studying moral psychology. As for Mona, I seized a chance for retribution two years post-divorce, dissuading her fiancé with insights into our marriage. Though a minor triumph, I'm vigilant through mutual friends. Despite the Matthews' intact marriage, Mona's control is evident. Parenthood seemingly outweighs family integrity. I'm thankful for discovering Mona's truth before starting a family of our own.